Tonight, Modi in Russia. Putin welcomes Modi to Moscow, calling him a dear friend as they discuss key issues in family ahead of official talks amid the Russia-Ukraine conflict. New alliances. Japan and Philippines sign defense pact to counter China's aggression and reduce US reliance in the South China Sea region. Trump's shadow. Biden and NATO allies gather in Washington amid concerns over Trump's potential return and global stability challenges. And dancing couple. Chinese dragon dance group from Sejiang Yang dazzles Spain with mythical love story at the 37 High End International Folk Festival. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Avadarana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Vinuth Varnasuriya. Good evening and welcome to World News Tonight. We have a lineup of stories for you this evening and our top story resolves around the latest diplomatic maneuvers, particularly focusing on Indian Prime Minister Modi's recent visit to Russia. Narendra Modi held formal talks with President Vladimir Putin in Russia today to strengthen relations amid Moscow's drift towards China. Yesterday, they had informal discussions at Putin's suburban residence in Novo Ogryavo, enjoying tea and walking in the park. Russian President Vladimir Putin welcomed Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi to Moscow, referring to him as a dear friend during Modi's first visit since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Modi shared his enthusiasm for strengthening the strategic partnership between the two nations on social media, highlighting the mutual benefits. Despite Western sanctions, Russia remains a critical supplier of discounted oil and weapons to India, with more than 40% of India's oil imports now coming from Russia. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky criticized Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi's visit to Russia, calling it a disappointment and a blow to peace efforts. Zelensky expressed his dismay over Modi meeting with Putin amidst ongoing Russian attacks attacks, including a recent deadly strike on a children's hospital in Kyiv. The visit is Modi's first to Russia since the 2022 invasion, reflecting India's aim to maintain strong ties with Moscow despite Western sanctions. Heading over to Turkey now. SpaceX launched their Turkey's first domestically built communication satellite on the 8th of July towards the geostationary orbit. TurkSat 6A, to be operated by state-owned satellite operator TurkSat, lifted off on a Falcon 9 rocket at 7.30 p.m. Eastern from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. Following the launch, Turkish President Erdogan expressed his gratitude to SpaceX and its founder Elon Musk, highlighting the strength and cooperation between Turkey and SpaceX. Earlier this year, SpaceX facilitated a ride to the International Space Station for Turkish astronaut Alpa Geravecci during the Axiom Mission 3. SpaceX also launched the other satellites for TurkSat, which include TurkSat 5B. Erdogan emphasized the national production of over 81% of the subsystems and software for the TurkSat 6A project, which aims to make Turkey capable of producing communication satellites independently. The launch faced challenging weather conditions, with meteorologists forecasting only a 30% chance of favorable conditions at liftoff due to thunderstorms and strong winds. Staying on the region now, the Philippines has signed a landmark defense pact with Japan, allowing troop deployment on each other's soil amid China's assertive actions. The reciprocal access agreement facilitates military cooperation and disaster response, marking Japan's first such agreement in Asia. The reciprocal access agreement is the first of its kind involving Japan in Asia and was signed by the Philippines Defense Secretary Gilberto Teodoro and Japanese Foreign Minister Yoko Kamikawa, who praised it as a landmark achievement. A joint statement highlighted the need for the international community to speak out on the importance of maintaining and strengthening the free and open international order based on the rule of law in the South China Sea. Amid increased tensions in the region, China's foreign ministry responded by saying the Asia-Pacific region does not need military blocs that instigate bloc confrontations or the new Cold War, while reminding Japan of its atrocities during the Second World War. And the course remains clear on the political scene in Tokyo as Governor Koike issued continued support for a renewed term in office. For more on this, we have other than the special correspondent Rasita Chandradasa joining us from Tokyo in Japan. Rasita, what's the situation out there? Tokyo has a new governor. 
I'm not quiet. It's the same old Koike Hideko. She won her third term as the Tokyo Metropolitan Governor on last Sunday by comprehensively uh, defeating both her main, two main opponents. That was Reho from the opposition. And there was a one slight surprise like a Ishimaru son, he actually an ex-mayor from a small village in Hiroshima. While the scale of the victory was a bit of a surprise for some political pundits, uh, Koikiriko's victory was never in doubt. Uh, she is immensely popular and she has the backing of the main parties in Japan, that is the ruling LDP and their partners, the Komeito. While the, the most surprised thing was the, the opposition party's Renko's defeat, which was far worse than anybody has ever expected. I mean, so much so, she was not even able to get 20% of the total votes. And she became third after losing badly to not only Koike Yuriko, but also to Ishimaru-san. And he was a dark horse before the election. And he became a surprise second. Uh, while Tokyo, is a country is a country within a country it's not just by far the richest in japan it is also said to be the richest in the whole world and its gdp is more than one trillion dollars so koikiriko her two terms she has performed such a way that even after the election over 60 percent of the tokyo population believes she has delivered what she has promised so the problem here is, on the same day there was a by-election for the Tokyo councillors and there were eight by-elections and the ruling LDP, they won just two, they lost six of the elections. So people may wonder why this happened, because ruling LDP supported Koike Yuriko. But it's a tricky part of Japanese election. The governor uh, Koike ran as an independent, even though the other party supported her, there were no official endorsement she was running at her own. So this election shows that some people like Koike are immensely popular, but the ruling LDP as a party is immensely unpopular right now. Over to you. Thank you. And that was Aladdin Nobel News Special Correspondent Rasita Chandradasa joining us from Tokyo in Japan. The French left acknowledged the challenge ahead of the election resulted in a hung parliament. Allies were relieved Marine Le Pen's national rally lost, but the leftist new popular front unexpected win promises volatility and potential gridlock. France faces a hung parliament and challenging negotiations to form a government. After a shock left-wing surge blocked Marine Le Pen's quest to bring the far right to power. The leftist new popular front, or NFP, came out top in the National Assembly after Sunday's election. No single group got a working majority. Possibilities include a broad, unwieldy coalition, or the NFP forming a minority government, heralding a period of political instability weeks before Paris hosts the Olympics. The left won 182 seats, President Emmanuel Macron's centrist alliance were on 168, and Le Pen's national rally and allies had 143. The interior ministry data cited by Le Monde newspaper showed. Sitting Prime Minister Gabriel Attal offered his resignation on Monday, though Macron asked him to stay on as caretaker to ensure stability. The political group I represented in this campaign, even if it scored three times more than what was predicted in recent weeks, does not have a majority. And so, being loyal to Republican tradition and to my principles, I will hand in my resignation letter to the President. Thousands rallied against the far right after the exit polls came in. The results were a huge blow for Le Pen's nationalist, Eurosceptic RN, which placed third after weeks of poll projections that it would win comfortably. EU officials breathed a sigh of relief that the immediate threat of a far right government was averted. But a messy coalition from a hung parliament could leave the Eurozone's second largest economy in limbo and pose headaches for European policy. And now what do we do? Le Parisien asked on Monday, summing up the bind in which Macron finds himself. He called the snap election after the far right trounced his ticket in the European Parliament elections last month. <laughs> Green Party leader Marine Tondelier said coalition talks would take time. Ce soir, la justice... Social justice won tonight. Ce soir, la justice... Environmental justice has won. 
Tonight, the people won. And it's only just the beginning. France's parliament will be split between three groups with different platforms and no tradition of working together. This is a short commercial break. More world news coming right after this. On the road to the White House tonight, with just four months left until the United States presidential elections, doubts among Democrats have prompted President Joe Biden to speak out in defense of his campaign. He made clear he would not step aside from the presidential race and sought to reassure his top donors and fundraisers. U.S. President Joe Biden is fighting back against criticism of his mental fitness and viability following a poor debate performance against Donald Trump last month. In a two-page letter sent to congressional Democrats on Monday, Biden emphasized that he is firmly committed to staying in the race and to beating Donald Trump. He added that it is time to come together, move forward as a unified party, and that any weakening of resolve would only serve to help Trump. On the same day, he also called into MSNBC's Morning Joe program, where he claimed that he had the support of the average Democrat and challenged his critics in the party. The White House press secretary denied speculation that the president is being treated for Parkinson's disease, while other party figures such as minority leader Hakeem Jeffries voiced support for Biden after four congressmen reportedly held a group call with him, urging their current candidate to step aside. The Democratic caucus meeting is due to take place on Tuesday for the first time since the June 27 debate and could prove a pivotal moment for the path forward. According to CNN, Biden has personally reached out to several Democrats to reassure them that he is aware of the current concerns within the party. He is also set to meet virtually with the Congressional Black Caucus, his strongest bloc of supporters in Congress, as well as members of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. The members of the CBC have defended Biden since the debate, with black voters being key to Biden's campaign as he chose the first black female vice president and nominated the first black woman to be a Supreme Court justice. With just over a month left until the Democratic National Convention, during which the party's presidential candidate is officially nominated, and four months until the U.S. presidential elections, this is a critical period for Biden's campaign. Ukraine defense and deterrence are set to dominate the agenda at the NATO summit which kick off in Washington, D.C. But looming over it all, the specter of Donald Trump's return and concerns among Democrats and foreign diplomats over Joe Biden's capacity to win re-election. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin welcomed NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg at the Pentagon on Monday, ahead of a NATO summit of world leaders in Washington this week. The summit, which kicks off Tuesday, marks the 75th anniversary of the Cold War era alliance. Representatives of 12 nations of Western Europe and North America assemble for the signing of the North Atlantic Treaty. The gathering is also meant to showcase the leadership of U.S. President Joe Biden, who rallied NATO allies to show new unity and purpose in the face of Russian President Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Biden underscored that point during a visit to France in June. But looming over what was meant to be a symbol of American-led unity is the potential return to power of Republican President Donald Trump, a change that could upend U.S. foreign policy. The Republicans' penchant for praising Putin and his threats that NATO members needed to pay more for mutual defense have alarmed allies. Among NATO allies have grown since Biden fumbled a June 27th debate boosting Trump in the polls ahead of a November 5th election. That means this week's summit, instead of highlighting Biden's diplomatic accomplishments, will be laser-focused on his fitness to hold office, and whether he will still be president in 2025. While much of the attention will focus on Biden amid growing calls within his own party to step aside, the delegates will have a full agenda focused on military and financial aid for Ukraine, and offering some pathway toward its eventual NATO membership. Hurricane Beryl made landfall in the southeast Texas yesterday morning, killing at least two people, closing ports and airports. After Hurricane Beryl hit Texas, knocking out power to three million homes and businesses, it weakened to a tropical depression.
Having been the season's earliest Category 5 hurricane on record when it hit the Caribbean days earlier, leaving at least 10 dead, Hurricane Beryl made landfall in Texas as a Category 1 hurricane with some 130 km per hour winds. It was downgraded to a tropical storm as it moved inland across Houston. Over a thousand flights at the George Bush Intercontinental Airport in Houston have been cancelled, while officials warned of destructive winds and up to 40 centimetres of rain accompanied by life-threatening storm surges. By Monday afternoon, according to PowerOutage.us, over 2.7 million customers in Texas were left without power. The U.S. National Hurricane Center said that Beryl is expected to move over the east of the state before moving into the lower Mississippi Valley and the Ohio Valley on Tuesday and Wednesday. The director of the Hurricane Center warned residents in Beryl's path to seek shelter as hazardous conditions will persist even after the center of Beryl moves through. Russia's massive bombardment against Ukraine struck largest children's hospital in Kiev killing 36 civilians, including two children, and injuring more than 170 across the country. Well, Russia denied targeting the hospital, saying it had been hit by fragments of Ukrainian air defense missile, while Ukraine said it had found remnants of Russian cruise missile. This is the terrifying moment Ukraine's largest children's hospital is hit by a missile. One of dozens of strikes on buildings across the country. The rare daytime Russian attack killing at least 36 civilians and injuring more than 170 across the country, according to Ukrainian authorities. Reports that three hard operations were being performed at the time of the strikes and that debris from the explosions fell into patients' open chests. Outside of what's now left of the hospital, injured and sick children with their families, dazed and sobbing. As first responders and volunteers sifted through the rubble looking for survivors, the sheer disbelief that sick children may have been intentionally targeted. President Zelensky saying Russian forces fired more than 40 missiles as he shared the haunting images of blood splattered on the floor and debris filling the hospital rooms. Hours later, Ukraine's largest maternity and fertility clinic was also hit. Falling debris leaving a gaping hole in the building and killing at least seven people. Other areas facing losses of life and property. A missile wreaking havoc on a residential building in the capital. Rescuers pulling out bodies of victims. The strikes destroying parts of Krivirich, leaving windshields smashed and debris littering roads in Kyiv's Lukyanivska district. The Russian Defense Ministry standing by the operation, saying the objectives of the strike have been achieved. The assigned objects are hit. Ukraine requesting an emergency meeting in light of the attacks. Directing attacks against civilian and civilian objects is prohibited by international humanitarian law, and any such attacks are unacceptable. President Zelensky promising a swift retaliation. Beyond any doubt, we are going to rebuild everything that these terrorists have destroyed. And beyond any doubt, we are going to answer these savages from Russia. Thousands marched in Barcelona against mass tourism impacting diners in La Barceloneta with water guns. Protesters symbolically taped off restaurants, urging a reduction in foreign visitors and confronting tourists with banners reading tourists go home. A water fight on the streets of Barcelona. Some locos spraying tourists with water guns as they ate at popular restaurants, sending visitors fleeing from their tables. Thousands of protesters walking through the city over the weekend, chanting, tourists go home, and carrying signs with anti-tourist slogans. Barcelona is one of the top tourist destinations in the world, home to iconic sites like La Sagrada Familia and Park Güell, in addition to beautiful beaches. Officials reporting more than 33 million people from all over the world visited the city in the first five months of 2024 alone. Tourism bringing in a whopping 9.6 billion euro in 2023 according to the Tourism Observatory of Barcelona. 
But some locals say mass tourism is not only overwhelming the city, but also making the cost of living unaffordable to its residents. Rent in Barcelona has risen nearly 70 percent in just the last decade, according to Mayor Jaume Colboni. In June, the mayor announcing a plan to stop renewing permits for rentals used by foreign visitors by 2028 after saying a boom in short-term rentals is to blame. The city assuring the move would make 10,000 units available to locals in four years. A dilemma for a welcoming city to shift focus and take care of its own. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news coming right after this. Welcome back. A group of amateur dragon dance performers from an eastern Chinese county have impressed Spanish audience with a fascinating show inspired by a mythical love story. Looping and swishing, colorful male and female dragons were moved through the stage with poles held by 19 Chinese dancers. Traditional dragon couple dance team from China's Sergian province crossed tens of thousands of miles to participate in the 37th International Folk Music and Dance Festival in Spain. The dragon couple dance was born in a small village in Shangxi County and it has been passed on for more than 100 years. And that wraps up our final roundup for this evening. We'll be back tomorrow with more crucial updates from around the globe. Up next is the nightly business report with Sinama Idunne. Thank you for watching and have a good night.